please stand for the lighting of the Shabbat candles? Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech ha'olam, asher kitshanu be'mitzvotav, v'tzivanu li hedlik, or la goim, v'natan lanu et Yeshua meshukenu, or ha'olam. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who sanctified us with your commandments, commanded us to be a light to the nations, and gave us Yeshua, our Messiah, the light of the world. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam, borei pri ha'gafen ha'metit, Yeshua ha'mashiach. Blessed are thou, Adonai our God, King of the universe, who creates the true fruit of the vine, Yeshua the Messiah. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam, asher kashanu b'mitzvotav, uvratzah avanu, b'shabbat kosho b'ahava, uvratzon hinhilanu, zikaron le ma'ase b'reshit. Ki hum yom tekila le mikre kodesh, zaker le tzi'at mitzrayim. Ki vanu berkarta ve'otanu kidashta mekol ha'amim. Beshabat ko shaka beava uvratzon hin kaltanu. Barukata Adonai mekades ha shabbat. Amen. Oh, English. Blessed are you, Lord, King of the universe, who made us holy with his commandments and favored us and gave us his holy Sabbath in love and favor to be our heritage as reminder of the creation. It is the foremost day of the holy festivals marking the exodus from Egypt. For out of all the nations you chose us and made us holy, and you gave us your holy Sabbath in love and favor as our heritage. Blessed are you, Lord, who sanctifies the Sabbath. Amen. Rukatar or Nai Elohenu Melka Alam Hamoji Lekim Hahaim Min Hashamain. Blessed are you, Lord our God, Master of the Universe, who gives us the living bread from heaven. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, we just welcome you into this house tonight. We welcome you, Lord God, and this is your house, and you come to the tabernacle with us, Lord. Inhabit our praises tonight, Lord, and send your spirit among us this evening, Lord God, that all the hearts will be touched in your house today, that we will feel your presence, Lord God, and we know how you like to rejoice with us, Lord, and how you like to be with us, Lord. You are welcome in this house. In Yeshua's mighty name, amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Announcements. Uh, the adult education book of Enoch class continues every Tuesday evening from 7 to 8.30. As a reminder, the book of Enoch class can be viewed via live streaming also from the comforts of your own living room and your lounge chair, right? But yes, we, we like it when you're here also because you don't realize it that when we take our breaks and we shut off the live streaming, we get in all kinds of crazy conversations. So it's really a good thing. <clears throat> but we don't dare keep that going to live streaming because 
because <laughs> the way that some of the conversations go. <clears throat> for such a time, radio broadcast. I have a radio program now called For Such a Time, and it's broadcast on KPXQ 1360 at 1 o'clock on Sunday afternoons. So, you, so if, you, if you're just really dying to hear me say something, you please tune in on Sundays. New members class, if you're interested in becoming part of the AMC family, we'll be holding a new members class on Saturday, February 3rd, after the service at 1 p.m. That is t tomorrow. So there will be a, a, a new members class tomorrow at 1 p.m. Rosh Chodesh Adar will be celebrated on Friday, February 16th from 7 to 8.30. Please note, because of Rosh Chodesh, there will not be an Arab Shabbat service. So there will not be an Arab Shabbat service or Oneg on February 16th. So on that day, we'll be doing Rosh Chodesh. And we've really been filling the house up lately on the Rosh Chodesh ceremonies. Because God, I don't know what's going on, but God really anoints his house on Rosh Chodesh. The moving of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, just the everlasting presence of the Lord will show up. So you need to be here for Rosh Chodesh. <clears throat> Our second Passover Seder meeting will be held on Saturday, February 17th at 1 p.m. We need volunteers to help. Please come and see where you fit in. We're getting in the final planning stages of our Passover. The uh, caterer has been selected. The, the place has been selected. And now, uh, in order to keep the prices down, uh, you may not realize it, but most Passover seders to offer a full meal out there will run you $100 to $200 a ticket. They're very expensive. But ours would be for $40. $40. Yeah. Well, there's a few scattered hand, hand claps there, okay? Yeah, there we go. <laughs> but the reason we keep it low is because of volunteers like you. We, with the caterer, he was willing to do everything, and the price of tickets were like this. I said, let us do the ceremonial stuff. We'll prepare the Seder plates. We'll get all the ceremonial stuff. And you just worry about the meals. And we brought the price way down when we did it, because we have our own Seder plates anyway for each table, so we brought, we brought the price down. Uh, on on uh, February 20th, uh, <clears throat> on that Tuesday evening, Enoch will be canceled on that evening. We won't have an Enoch on the 20th of February, and the reason is, is my fault. I'm actually going to be having dinner with the Ex-commander of the IDF forces of Israel. So let's say, actually skip a night of Enoch or have dinner with this guy. Hmm, okay, I think I'll have dinner with the guy. So, and uh, along with about three uh, state representatives will be there. It'll be a private dinner at, at a house. And one of the state representatives know I'm a good friend of his, and he, he knows I like things like that, so he invited me to go to this dinner. Boy, do I have questions for this guy. Going to be a pretty, pretty interesting dinner. So ticket sales for Passover will begin on February 10th. That's next week. We are finalizing details. Watch your bulletins for more information coming. It's that time of year we're getting ready for Passover. Amen? All right, time for... Testimonies. We always give a, a few minutes every Arab Shabbat for people to talk about the things God has done in their life because we all want to hear how God is moving. Because we know our God is an active God. We know our God does miracles. We know our God will help us out in time of need even for the little things. So we'll open it up for a few minutes here. Who has a testimony they want to share? Okay, Stuart. I managed to get myself. I managed to get myself into a pretty good squeeze. Uh, my foot slipped off the brake, and I hit the gas pedal and right into a wall. Everybody knows that I was a little bit stiff with the neck and everything else. Well, 
The Lord has worked his miracles. Amen. And now I'm better. And thank you, Lord, for all that you do for all of us. Amen. Thank you, Stuart. Anybody else? Ralph? Thank you, Rabbi. I told the people on Thursday night at our prayer service that I had had this agonizing, continual little cough. It, would, it stuck with me. It's kind of like the flu that was going around. And I got tired of it. So, Wednesday night when I went to bed, I asked God. I said, God, you got to take it away. I'm done with this thing. I can't do it. you got to take it away. And I says, I know you can. I got real serious with him because he and I have had serious talks in the past. It wasn't flippant. And I says, I really need you to do this. And he did. I woke up the next morning. I haven't coughed. I had to clear my throat a few times, but no cough. No agonizing, dragging on, cough, cough, cough thing. So he does work those little miracles like that. But you have to be serious about it and you have to believe he can do it. And that's one of the tricks. You have to believe. Amen. Lucy? It's all right. <laughs> so um, two weeks ago on Saturday, I felt pain on my body. So, and I, I didn't want to pay so attention. And I said, probably it's nothing serious. So, but someday, the pain is still there. I said, oh my goodness, you know, and I start to pray. So Monday, when I wake up, was, I, the pain it was there. I said, well, I, I have to go to the doctor for to make an appointment. So and the doctor gave me an appointment for February 28th. And I said to the lady, but the pain, I, I have a pain. What kind of, I came to wait in February 28th. So you dije, well, this, I have to wait. Anyway, so I'm start to pray. Um, the pain is gone on Thursday. When I wake up, you dije, oh, my gosh. Thank you so much Amen. because, because I've, I, I'm start to be worried for that. But the miracle is from God is, is amazing. I'm so happy for that, and I just want to share with you. Amen. Okay? Amen. Thank you, Amen. Amen. Bless the Lord. Anybody else? Catherine? Well, Catherine's coming up. Uh, a lot of you know that uh, uh, Roberto was taken to the hospital yesterday because he had numbness in his arms and his side, and they thought maybe he had a stroke. They went and checked him out. We immediately all went into prayer. They went and checked him out and said, there's nothing wrong with you. Go home. So he went home. And er so far, the best report we understand, Bridget, anything changed? He's doing fine? Amen. So as Mina was taking him to a hospital, we all went into prayer. So by the time he got there, they said, go home. Praise God. Isn't that cool? So this is a, a small testimony of just how the Lord it works with us as we call upon him in our day. Um, first of all, I want to say that I'm blessed to be able to prepare food for Friday night service, for the Shabbat service. I've always enjoyed that. We've, we did that in our home with my kids. I would make challah bread. We would dress up fancy and invite the Lord into our home every Friday night. And then life happened, and we started not doing it anymore. And I'm like, Lord, I really want to start doing that. And then this, now I get to cook for my other family. And it is a blessing. Um, but today was, was kind of funny as we were preparing the food. And I say we because Brian was helping me uh, with the chicken tonight. And unfortunately, the chicken got burnt. <laughs> and he's like, it doesn't look too bad. I'm like, yes, it does. We are not serving that. And we were running around doing stuff. And I, I, I always calculate how much time I need to cook because I have to we don't have a kitchen here, but we're still praying and believing God's going to bring us into a bigger building so we can have a kitchen. Um, so thank the Lord. I just live right down the street, but I do like to take it from the oven and rush here so you all can have hot food. And it's a challenge. 
And, um, you know, sometimes it's a challenge just getting it to your own kitchen table hot, right? All at the same time. So anyways, um, Brian birthed the food. I thought the potatoes were going to take uh, an hour, and it was supposed to be 90 minutes. And because the chicken was burnt, we had to leave early. I only had 40 minutes for those potatoes. I have no idea. Now, Dora needed hers done a little bit more. But I stuck the knives, and I'm like, how are these done? And I'm like, they're done. Let's go. We wrapped them up, and we prayed all the way. We're like, we're going to Fry's to get chicken tonight. <laughs> and we prayed, and I'm like, and usually at dinner time at Fry's, they run out of chicken sometimes, and there's usually a line. I'm like, Lord, please, please make a way tonight, please. And we just got, I got right in there. Nobody was there. There was no chicken in there. And I go, the lady was behind the counter, and I said, how long for your chicken? She goes, oh, I have it right here. And I go, you do? And it was on sale because we had to kind of, you know, buy extra chicken tonight. <laughs> so anyways, I was just so thankful to the Lord. He, he, he's, he's, he always is there with us when we're going through. I'm, I'm, I'm thankful that he just provided. Oh, the other thing is 10 people signed up, and next week we're having a wonderful soup. I can't pronounce it. It's, um, what is it, uh, Lucy? Lucy's going to cook next week, and it's going to be this wonderful soup with all these vegetables and turkey meatballs with cornbread because I'm not going to be here next week, so Lucy is going to do that. But we had 10 people sign up, and we actually fed 20 people tonight. I don't know how that happened either. Uh, and we, there was leftover dessert, Judy, after 20. Was there a quarter piece still there? For, see, the Lord even provided for you what you wanted. See how the Lord does that? So anyways, I just, I praise God so much with all my heart and everything within me. Amen. Thank you. How many of you know that the Lord cares? How many know that the Lord watches down and rejoices in his people? How many of you know that the Lord is so happy when we call upon his name? Amen. Fantastic. He is a loving God, and we serve a mighty God. Amen. Okay, so we're going to have the whites come up and do the family blessing now. All right, ladies may stay seated, and we're just going to ask the gentlemen to stand up so that we can give a blessing that is normally done in the household. This is our ble Sabbath blessings over our families, and we'll begin by speaking a special blessing over the men of our congregation. Ladies, please join me as we extend our hands towards our husbands, fathers, and brothers. Happy is the one who has not walked in the advice of the wicked, nor stood in the way of sinners, nor sat in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the Torah of Adonai, and on his Torah he meditates day and night. He will be like a planted tree over streams of water, producing its fruit during its season. Its leaf never droops, but in all he does, he succeeds. You may be seated. And ladies, if you would now stand, we'd like to bless our wives, sisters, and mothers. So gentlemen, please extend your hands uh, toward our women and join me in this special blessing. A woman of valor, who can find... She is worth far more than precious jewels. The heart of her husband safely trusts in her, and he profits greatly thereby. So ladies, you may be seated. And we have any children? We have children. All right. So parents, awesome. And for you, for you online viewers right now, we'd like to extend uh, this blessing uh, to our children. And for our sons, May God make you as Ephraim and Manasseh. And for our daughters, may God make you like Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, and Leah. All right, amen. And, and now let's worship the Lord.
Well, praise God. Did I get everybody's blood moving? Amen. Amen. Well, uh, shalom, my friends. Tonight, I am finishing up a sermon that I started last Shabbat uh, that was based on our Torah uh, service that we had. And it covered the, the uh, give me just a sec, I've got to catch my breath. <laughs> Ooh, too much excitement, huh? All right, I think I can make a, put, it, put together an entire sentence now. <laughs> So um, it covered, our tour service covered from Exodus 15.22 to Exodus 16.4. And as I said last uh, Shabbat, that's an area that the Lord has just really uh, had me uh, focused on for many years. And he just continues to open it up. And so we're going to finish up uh, something that I started then. Um, the title of this study comes from the Disciples' Prayer, specifically Matthew chapter 6, verse 13. Now, in the complete Jewish Bible that we use for our recitation uh, every Shabbat, we have a rendition that almost every other English language translation doesn't have, where we use the words hard testing, and the line is, lead us not into hard testing. Uh, most other translations just about exclusively use temptation. Now, the differences we saw last Shabbat turns out to be very important. There's a big difference between testing and temptation. And, and it's, it's not insignificant either as directly understood within the text itself or possibly more importantly how it impacts our understanding of God and what it is that he has set about to accomplish in the lives of the Hebrew in the wilderness and probably more important to you and I uh, what it is that he set about to do in your life and in my life. Okay. Um, the short answer to the question of the difference between testing and temptation came directly from exploring the Hebrew and Greek words that are rendered as test or tempt in the English. Turns out that the English rendering of these Hebrew and Greek words does not stay true to what the words mean and in fact adds a great deal of confusion to the word of God, God regarding testing and temptation. Now in the English you lose uh, that there is a very important distinction and difference between the two. In Hebrew, the word that means trial or test is the word nasah. And specifically, it was a sniff test, a very discriminating and discerning test. Remember, it turns out that the nose is capable of discriminating over a trillion, one trillion with a T different sense. Uh, a sniff test conveys the idea of the ability to discern with great clarity to a deep level of understanding. Uh, and if that's true for man, consider that when God does a sniff test, he's going to bring about perfect clarity and perfect understanding. Now, in the case of the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament, we had to do a little bit more digging. But from the Greek, we saw that here, too, the words, when correctly understood from the Greek, brought more clarity to an otherwise very confused understanding presented in the English. We found that there was a cluster of words in the Greek that were used to convey the concept of testing uh, or a test that proved a positive. In fact, one of the words specifically was derived from a word that means trustworthy. Okay? The concept is a test that positively proves trustworthiness. Okay. Now, these words should have been translated as trial or test or prove. Uh, and in contrast to these words, there was another group that, was con that conveyed the idea of testing to prove a negative. Okay. One of these words, interestingly, is also derived from the Greek word that means trustworthy. However, you would understand it as to prove untrustworthiness, okay, to prove the negative. Um, these words would correctly be translated as temptation. Okay, so you have one group that should be translated as trial, the other should be translated as temptation. Uh, the difference really is vital. Uh, God tests for faith, and his primary goal in testing is to do you good in the end. Uh, he describes the good that he will do to Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 8, looking back at the time of the manna and the daily test that he administered to Israel, described in Exodus chapter 16. And then toward the end of the passage from Deuteronomy 8, he explicitly says that he tested them to do them good in the end. 
His desire is that we would be successful in the test and that our faith would be encouraged, strengthened, and expanded by the test. So much so that his chesed, his ever-powerful, ever-present, loving kindness, grace, and mercy, his chesed, as we would say in the Hebrew, with that, he gives us the answer to the test before he begins testing. Right? How great is our God? He wants us to do something specific, and he hands it to us on a silver platter. Now, the adversary, by contrast, tempts to elicit your fall to sin. Uh, and his point is to do us harm in the end. His is a temptation to failure, uh, that our faith would be discouraged, okay, that it would be weakened, that it would be contracted back to be smaller than before our fall to temptation. Now, unfortunately, the English translators generally render both of these words, these groups of words, as the same thing. And they render them in the English as to tempt or temptation. Okay? The lack of clarity immediately leads to confusion in the English text directly, uh, as well as creating in the mind of the reader severe theological problems. Specifically, that a righteous holy God in whom there is no unrighteousness, I'm sorry, there is, yeah, there is no unrighteousness, no sin, right? He then becomes the originator of sin if he is causing us to be tempted, okay? This is a logical contradiction and a misrepresentation of the character and nature of God. God does not sin, and he does not cause us to sin either, okay? Now, it's important to revisit how we were led into this discussion in the first place. Uh, the, the Torah portion that I read last week from Exodus 15:22 to Exodus 16.4, use that word for sniff test, uh, the concept of God testing with perfect clarity and understanding of the faith of Israel. It used it twice inside of six verses. And not only does he use this concept of a detailed discriminating test twice inside the six verses, but also within those six verses, he also gives us the answer to the test. Okay. And I would tell you that, that it wasn't just a test for Israel back in the wilderness. It's a test for you and I today as well. What he asks of us has not changed by the slightest jot or tittle. Okay. It is due to God's chesed, his loving kindness, grace, and mercy, that he lays out for us exactly what is required of Israel and of you and of me to pass the test. He gives us the answer to the test before we take the test because he wants us to succeed. He wants, us, he wants to do us good in the end. Okay? So what is it that God requires? Well, it's to shma shma to his voice. That is to perfectly hear his voice, to perfectly listen with understanding and comprehension, and then to give a considered response. To step out in faith and to do what God has asked. That's the considered response response. You have to look at your circumstances. You have understood God's word and where they differ. Now you got to make a decision. And what you should do is to step out in faith, to walk in the ways of the Lord, to do what he has asked. Tishmoa tishma, to perfectly hear God's voice, to listen with understanding, and to give that considered response. And just in case you don't quite get that, it, that the considered response that you're supposed to have is one that would agree with God, he lays that out for you too within those six verses. So there can be no question. We are to shma shma to the voice of Adonai our God to do what is upright in his eyes. That's to apply his laws with his heart and his understanding. This will only be possible if we undertake to do what he says next, which is to carefully consider, to explore, to uh, the details, the implications, the nuances of, and to come to know concretely his commandments. Now, to know God's commandments this deeply is to understand God. In understanding better the mind of God and with the help of the Holy Spirit, we can apply God's law as it is to be applied, to do what is upright in his eyes, okay? rightly discerning the will of God. 
And lastly, he calls us to zealously keep and to protect and guard his statutes, both within our own attitudes and actions, but also to raise the alarm when the attitudes and actions of others begin to distort and to bend his image, to tear down and rebuild his statutes into the image and likeness of man fallen to sin. So we should zealously keep and protect and guard his statutes. Now the second use of the word Nassau, he sets up the daily test to determine whether or not Israel will walk in his Torah or not. Now whether they will hear his voice, listen carefully to what it is that he asks of them, and then do it. This daily test of the Hebrews was administered via the instructions that God gave concerning the manna. Now the instructions were fairly specific. He tells them to glean an omer, and that's omer the heap, to gather in a, a heap of, of the manna, and to do that on the first six days of the week. Now interestingly, no matter how much or how litter, little that their heap was, when they go to prepare it, God made it exactly one omer, the unit of measure, the first five days of the week, and he made it exactly two omers, the unit of measure, on the sixth day. Okay? They were not to save any of it over for the next day as it grew worms and stank on any of the first five days, but then they were to save it over on the sixth day, on the sixth night, and it would not go bad. It would not grow worms and it would not stink uh, only on this one day, which is the beginning of the Sabbath. God would provide them provision on the Sabbath. They were not to go out to search for manna on the Sabbath. They were to believe God that there would be none on the Sabbath, as he had said. So seven days a week they were tested. Daily they were tested. Now we talked about how the Jewish sages through the oral law, the oral tradition, uh, tell us that there were three groups amongst the Hebrews. There were those that were righteous and faithful, and to them the manna tasted like anything they could imagine. And they found it directly on or right outside of their tents. They literally didn't have to go anywhere to get it. In the second group, those that were somewhat righteous and somewhat faithful, the manna tasted to them like sweet cake. And they had to search a little bit for it outside the camp, but they found it fairly quickly and were back in the camp fairly fast. And the last group were those who lacked righteousness and lacked faith. The manna to them tasted like porridge. This group had to really forge a field for the manna, traveling a ways away from the camp to eventually find it. Now, we picture in our heads and think of manna falling like snow and covering the ground pretty much equally everywhere, but the experience is given to us from the oral tradition is very different from that. Okay? Consider that if those without faith could have seen the manna lying around in the camp, like those who had good faith, they would have just picked it up there and not had to go so far. And if you consider that the early bird catches the worm, they could get up early and go to those that were righteous and take a little bit of manna. Remember, it doesn't matter how much or how little their heap is. When they go to measure it, it will be exactly one omer. They're not going to miss if they go over and take a pinch, literally, of the manna that's on the, the tent or on the ground in front of their, their tent. But they can't see it. They don't know that it's there. And so they have to travel out of the camp to go find the manna. Okay. Since it was God who miraculously made the manna, uh, the amount that they gleaned, either the one or the two omas, omers, uh, depending on the day, really, you know, it, it comes down to a faith thing. They didn't have it, and they couldn't see it in the camp itself, and they had to travel a field for it. So... If you think about it from the standpoint of God is trying to do them good, right? Everybody, the righteous, those that are somewhat righteous, those that are, that are not righteous at all, God intended to do them good in the end. 
And if you think of it from the standpoint of it being an enticement, it starts to make a little bit more sense. The good that God intended to do them was to build up their faith and move them from the unfaithful group into the somewhat faithful group. And eventually to move them from the somewhat faithful group into the faithful group. Okay? And you have to remember that, that this really is a heart issue, as Yeshua tells us. You, know, you can go out and do the right thing in the right way, but if your heart is set against the Lord God Almighty, it would still be an unrighteous and unfaithful task that you undertake because you did so with a heart that rebelled against God. Even at this level, it would be a heart test of their faith and their love of God. So, I don't find this anywhere. Uh, this is my speculation, my guess. But it's my belief that, that depending on their heart the day prior and their heart that day, the faith that they brought at that moment, that they would either find the, the manna further afield, if they were lacking further still in faith, or they would find it closer to camp. And it's kind of like what we do to train dogs. You, you put it out in front of them, you make it easier for them to get, and you slowly bring them into the behavior that you want them to do. I think God was doing the same thing with them here. But this is my guess. So one of the things that, that draws me to that conclusion is that, um, that this progressive reward system, um, it's not just that it would match well with what God would, we would expect that God would be doing to try to do us good, right? He really doesn't want people to stay where they are if they're unfaithful. He wants them to be built up in their faith and to, to get to where they are in the group of the righteous. That's what he has for all of us through the sanctification process. But a God that seeks for you and seeks for me that he might make us through the faith that he originates, the faith that he completes in us, that he might make of us a kingdom of a priest and a holy nation, he is the God of redemption and the God who rescues us. So, but I do have some support for why it might be a progressive type of reward system. Okay? Um, so, God, had, we recognize uh, that in the midst of what was occurring out there, there was, in fact, a progressive punishment system that God was, was implementing. And so this would mirror a progressive reward system. And that's going to lead us directly into the concept of why it's appropriate to recite the statement, do not lead us into hard testing, uh, instead of do not lead us into temptation. Now, the word used in Matthew chapter 6, 13 is the word in Greek that means a test or a trial that proved a positive. Uh, God tests for faith, character, and his primary goal in testing us is to do us good in the end. His desire is that we would be successful in the test and that our faith would be encouraged and strengthened and expanded by the test. Matthew 6, 13 absolutely talks about a trial or a test. It also absolutely uses words in the Greek that conveys that it is God who is leading us into the testing. Okay, remember last week the Pope and some others have said, well, it's not really God that's doing it, it's us leading ourselves into temptation. Well, no, the Greek actually does say that it is God that's doing the, the, the leading into the testing. Now, since we know that, that from James chapter 1 and 1 Peter chapter 1, that testing or trial is to be counted as a joy and that it works to create in us cheerful endurance that is designed to do us good and to per perfectly prepare us to be useful to God, uh, that it should be more precious to us to be tried than gold. The only way that we can, can understand these and put them together with Matthew 6.13 and make it agree with James and 1 Peter is if the testing is the other type of testing of the Lord, the hard testing. Okay, so let me show you the hard testing that is also associated with the manna. Hard testing is intended to still do us good, but it's hard because of the hardness of our hearts and our rebellion against God. So please, Lord, do not lead me there. Give me a clean heart and a desire for the things of you. The progressively harder testing starts in Exodus chapter 16. Now, this this Early test is an easy test, right? 
when Israel fails, all they get is a verbal chastisement, right? God says, how long will you not walk in my Torah? But he doesn't have any real punishment for them there. The heart of Israel is in rebellion against God and pines away over the bread that they had in Egypt uh, that they ate to their full satisfaction, they said, and the pots of flesh that they sat over. And remember, he gives them the quail without consequence and the manna. Uh, and even though they do not pass the test, it's just the verbal chastisement that he gives them at that point, okay, for not shmying to his voice. Now, in Numbers chapter 11, we find two separate episodes of harder testing and much harder consequences. The first has the people in the edges of the camp complaining. Now, who would be at the edges of the camp? Well, it's going to be those in the faithless group, right? God is at the very center of the camp. And they're not really wanting to have anything to do with him, so they're going to be at the, at the edges. They also are the ones that are having to travel a field to go find the manna. Now, it says that they did not just complain about the Lord, but it says in the Hebrew that they became complainers and that their souls were speaking evil of God uh, about everything. So we probably all know people who complain about stuff, but maybe just generally have a, a fairly happy outlook on life. But we also know people that are just through and through. They hate everything. And they complain about everything. If they get something nice, they're still going to complain about it. That's what they're describing in the Hebrew. And it says that, that the Lord God consumes them with the fire of the Lord, the same fire that he consumes Nadab and Abihu with, and also the water-soaked offering that Elijah prepares in the presence of the priest, priest of Baal. Now, he begins to consume them with the fire of the Lord, but they run to Moses and plead for Moses to intervene with God. Now, this is an act of faith, right? And it was rewarded by God because he ceased to burn them up. Now, you think they would probably learn their lesson. But you literally go to the very next verse in Numbers chapter 11, and they're at it again. And now they're complaining about the manna and waxing poetic about how good they had it in Egypt. Numbers chapter 11, verses 4 to 6 says, And the mixed multitude was among them, fell a lusting, and the children of Israel also wept again, and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish that we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. But now our soul is dried away, and there is nothing at all except this manna besides our eyes. Yeah, slaves who ate freely all the fish that they wanted while they were still having to go out and gather their straw to make their brick quotas. God gives them quail again, but this time the quail comes with a consequence. They would grow tired of the quail. In Numbers 11, 18 through verse 20, I'm sorry, Numbers chapter 11, verses 18 through 20, God speaks to Moses and says, and say thou unto the people, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow, and you shall eat flesh. For you have wept in the ears of the Lord, saying, Who shall give us flesh to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you flesh, and you shall eat. You shall not eat one day, nor two days, nor five days, neither ten days, nor twenty days, but even a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils, and it be loathsome unto you, because you have despised the Lord which is among you, and have wept before him, saying, Why did we come out of Egypt? Okay. If they had shmahed to God at that point, the test would have been hard. But because they do not shma to the voice of Adonai, their God, the test actually turns deadly. You see, God sends quail that fell from the sky to a depth of three feet, two cubits it says, that's 36 inches, and over an area, an area that was more than a day's journey away from the camp in all directions. So they're literally standing in quail. There was more quail than they could ever possibly do anything with. And if you work out the calendar dates for when the quail came, it came on a Friday. 
on the preparation day before the Sabbath. Camp in all directions. And what the text tells us is that they gathered, not quail. gleaned, here is truly there was more the word quail gathered, than they could ever and they gathered do the quail all day. And if you work day. out the calendar dates and all night, or when the quail and gathered came, into the next day, on a Friday. well, beginning at sundown, they were the Sabbath, gathering on the Sabbath. And what the text tells us, in the beginning of the Sabbath and all day on the Sabbath, they gathered the quail. And they gathered God the quail was not amused. And as the quail, it says, was still in their mouths, he sent a plague to kill those who refused to shmah unto the voice of Adonai their God, and who did not honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. And this is a pretty hard test, but it gets worse. As you see, the hardness of some of Israel's hearts gets worse, too. It is one thing to complain about the manna. It is wholly and totally another level of transgression to loathe the manna. Now, to understand why this would be so bad, recognize that the manna is a symbol for Yeshua HaMashiach. He is the true manna from heaven and tells us so specifically in John chapter 6, verse 58. So when they said that they loathed the manna, they were in effect saying that they loathed Yeshua HaMashiach. But even here, though the test in Numbers chapter 21 will be much harder, fiery serpents that caused excruciating pain and then death that were sent by God into the camp, Numbers 21, uh, verse 4 to 9 reads, And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom, and the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water. And our soul loathes this light bread. The word is manna in the Hebrew. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray unto, unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. Remember last time, it stopped right away. But verse 8 tells us, And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he look upon it, he shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it on a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent bit any man, when he beheld the brass, the serpent of brass, he lived. Now, notice that unlike before, when they petitioned Moses, God does not stop the fiery serpents. They have spoken against the Lord's anointed one. They have spoken against the one and only way of salvation, Yeshua. God will give them a lesson in salvation. It's going to give them a lesson in faith and consequences for lack of faith, faith that would cost them their lives. Will you now shma? Is your heart so very hard that you would refuse to do the simple thing that the voice of Adonai, your God, has placed before you? To, in faith, look upon the brass serpent that is raised high upon the stake? Believe and be saved. Believe not and perish because your heart hates God and loves evil, and will not, at, even at the point of death, do this little thing, and through faith, save your soul. John 3 does not begin and end with John 3.16, though most people would seem to think that it does. Hear it now with the context that Yeshua laid before Nicodemus, starting in verse 13 and continuing to verse 21. And no man has ascended up to the heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that, belie does, uh, that believes on him is not condemned, but he that believes not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. 
And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that does evil hates the light, neither comes to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that does truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be be made manifest, that they were wrought of God. Even in the midst of very hard testing, God provides the means of escape. And it is simple. It is easy. It did not change from the first time he gave us the answer. Just Shema. Set aside your pride. Set aside your rebellion unto death. Set aside the hardness of your heart and do the simple, easy thing that he has set before you. And that has always been right at your side within your grasp. If you would only choose to do the simple little thing, just Shema. But we are like Naaman in our pride and in our arrogance at times. Naaman was one of the greatest of all Syrian generals. He'd accomplished so very much in the world of men, but recognize this. That which is easy is sometimes the hardest undertaking that we will face. For Naaman against the enemy without uh, he had, had strength and cunning and talent to marshal the troops and to rally and win the day against all foes. But against himself, he could not undertake the simplest and the easiest of challenges placed upon him. Shema. He could not hear the voice of God spoken through the prophet Elisha and give a considered response to do what was spoken. To do this simple thing, to go down to the Jordan River and to dip himself seven times in the Jordan and thereby get his leprosy healed. Strength of arms, strength of wit, strength of cunning and courage, these came easily to Naaman, but submission to the voice of God spoken through the prophet Elisha to do this simple, easy thing, not even a consideration. In fact, it caused him to be angry with the prophet and angry with God. The testing of God requires nothing more, nothing less than Shema. Hear God's voice and do what he asks. God tests us to increase our faith, to deepen our faith, to exercise our Shema. That's the answer to our daily test, Shema. It's so simple, but it requires that we submit our will to his. And if you struggle to hear God's voice, begin with prayer. And if you do not know Yeshua as your Lord and Savior, if you have not submitted your life to him, you are not saved. And like the Israelites who refused to look upon the brass serpent that was lifted high on the cross, there will be no salvation for you without your placing yourself under his sovereignty and his authority and making him the one that rules and reigns over your heart, over your destiny over your marriage, your relationships, your finances, over all that you are and all that you have. If you are not there, you will have no salvation of the Lord. But know this, Yeshua came that the world through him might be saved. But you have to step forward in faith and look upon him who was pierced and recognize Yeshua as the one and only Son of God, the one and only way of salvation. There is no other way. Call on him, and he will save you. If you have submitted your life and you are struggling, know that you're not alone in this. We are called unto fellowship, because fellowship is how we carry each other and lift each other up and strengthen the faith of one another. Be in prayer for God to bring you into fellowship with strong believers who can teach you and guide you and when necessary are willing to stand up and reprove you and not let you walk off the path of Adonai. Be in prayer for God to open his word to you. Come to our Shabbat class and our Tuesday night adult education and persevere in these things. Grapple with the word that you would understand it. We will help you. But you got to come. You have to be there, and you have to be in your word. That's why we're here, to bring the word of God into this world. Pick up a Bible that is in a language that you can understand. Even if you get the worst of translations, 
There is enough Yeshua that the Holy Spirit can teach you and bring you to where God wants you to be. Faithfully hearing his voice and being a doer of the word and a member of the kingdom of priests, the holy nation. Shema to the voice of Adonai. It's a dynamic process. It's about motion and mercy. It's about motion and Shema. It's one step in front of the other on the pathway of God, making the ascent that he has marked out for those who love him to draw them near to him, that he might make us acceptable in his eyes through the blood of Yeshua, so that you can stand pani el pani, face to face with God. Shema, it's the simple thing that he places before us, but it's the, the thing that we will struggle with. Amen? All right. And now we will have our offering. Thank you, Elder Rossi. That was great. Bless the Lord. This congregation is very blessed to have a lot of good Bible teachers. Amen. Hold up your offerings. We'll pray over your offerings. Father God, we just bless you this day. We thank you, Lord, for everything that you had given unto us, Lord. We're not deserving of your blessings, Lord. But you bless us because we love you, because you love us. And, Lord, we just want to return that which you command, your tithes and offerings, Lord. Return it back to you, Lord. And, Father, I just ask that you bless the givers and multiply back to them, Lord, that they may prosper in your holy name. In Yeshua's name, amen.
Bless the Lord. Amen. Jim, would you come up here a moment and explain what's going on at your house tomorrow? What's going on? <laughs> okay. Uh, tomorrow at 2 o'clock, um, a friend of ours, Henry Groover, is going to be there. 3 o'clock. 2 o'clock. 2 o'clock. Two o'clock. It's for the church here only. Yeah. <laughs> and so... Uh, um, you need the address. Come up afterwards. I'll give it to you. <laughs> okay, and hope uh, you be praying for it. Uh, it's it really gives you the revelation word, and uh, I don't know. You'll you'll love the man. He's a humble man like this man. Oh, thank you, Jim. Okay, okay. <laughs> thank you, Jim. Bless the Lord. Our God is so good. And time is getting shorter. You know, the candle's burning down. And, uh, you know, some people, they start to worry and fret about it and wonder what's coming out upon the world. Yes, it will not be nice. But there's something about knowing that the Lord is at hand that helps you get through all of that. We know everybody's going to eventually die, you know, one way or another. So I think, you know, the idea that we should be fearful of what's coming on the world is we shouldn't be. Because the opposite of fear is faith. And so we need to have faith. We need to walk. That God has got his eyes on us. That God's going to be watching after us. And as far as, you know, things like the rapture and all, and all that, there will be raptures. Lots and lots of questions remain exactly how it's going to happen. But I do know, you know, when Paul was talking about it, he said they wouldn't happen until the Son of Man, Son of Perdition is revealed at the last trump. Well, the Son of Perdition is the beast of Revelation. So he's got to come on the scene. Already there's people out there today saying, the rapture's going to happen. I think the last thing I heard, they said here in February sometime, the rapture was going to happen. And every time I hear stuff like that, I said, where's the temple? Where's the beast? They got to be here. Now, the temple could be a tabernacle, but still, where is it? None of that stuff is here. Where is the blood of the martyrs filling up the sword of the Lord in Isaiah 34? Where is that? You know, so it, it, it's not going to happen next month, in case you guys have heard things about that. This coming month, I'm not last month. Yeah, It's not going to happen last month. Really? <laughs> but it's not going to happen next month. And as the way things are right now, it's not going to happen for a while yet. But the thing we focus on is righteousness of the Lord and walking on him. Because... It doesn't matter. If you're walking in the righteousness of the Lord, if it happens this coming year or the next year or the year after, you're walking in his righteousness. What does it matter? There's no scripture that says you got to figure it out or you're not going to be raptured. There's no scripture like that. But the Lord did say he will catch many people unawares because they weren't ready. The parable of ten virgins, obviously a great parable about that. Five were not ready. So we always got to be ready. Luke 21 says, pray that you are counted worthy to escape these things coming upon the earth. And the real wrath of God is probably the pouring out of the seven vials of Revelation. That is the real wrath of God when that happens. Because those seven vials affect the whole planet. The, the seals and the trumpets kind of come and go. There's a lot of bad things that do happen with the seals and the trumpets. But the wrath of God is the seven vials. So we just keep our eyes on him, right? Amen. So uh, if anybody needs prayer, we'll hang around a little bit. Uh, myself and the elders uh, and pastors will all hang around a little bit, and uh, we'll pray for you if you need prayer. Amen. Father, we just thank you for this evening. We bless you and honor you. And Lord, 
Cover these people as they go home, Lord God. Cover them in the spirit and cover them in their bodily form, Lord God, that you deliver them safely to their home, that they get a good night rest of the night, Lord God, that they will dream dreams of you, Lord God, in all their ways and all their comings and goings. In Yeshua's mighty name, amen. God bless everybody. We'll see some of you tomorrow, and others we'll see next week.